another edition of the Double Digit Hockey Show. I am your host, Johnny Stope. Of course, we are available here on the ASTV Productions site. Uh, today, we've got a very special guest joining me. I'll get to that in just a quick second here. Don't forget to follow the show on your social media platforms at Double Digit Hockey. Uh, so without further ado, can to introduce my guest. Many of you already recognize the face on the screen with me today. Uh, host of Hockey Night in Can and with Sportsnet. Uh, he's also known for a lot in the past. He's been with ESPN. He's done Raptors coverage, even in the Olympic Games. David Amber joins me. David, thank you so much for your time today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, John. I uh, really appreciate this. It's uh, it's awesome to have these veteran broadcasters come and join us amateurs here as we tend to try and get our broadcasting lives going here. So I really appreciate the time that you, that you and some of your coaches have, have given to me. Um, there's no other way for me to start this than to go straight to a personal thing for me. Something that I've always really loved to enjoy is, is watching Hockey Night in Canada. And I have to know how it is working with Ron McLean. <laughs> It's fantastic. It's uh, it's kind of surreal because obviously, you know, I remember uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, you know, as a huge fan watching Hockey Night in Canada and there was Ron and Don and the whole gang uh, back in the day. And uh, now to be a colleague and a friend, uh, it's fantastic. And he's been a great mentor. Uh, he's shown me a lot. He connects in such an incredible and authentic way with the viewers. And uh, I, I've learned a lot from him, and he's been incredibly, you know, gracious and helpful uh, during my career. So it's uh, it's really fantastic to be a friend and colleague of his now. His knowledge of the game of hockey, not just that the level, is absolutely incredible. Um, to have that mind to pick from, how how does that help you in, to have Ron McLean and all that knowledge at your disposal? Well, what's amazing, he has an incredible ability to retain information and subtleties. Like you're watching the game with him and he's picking up little things that happened during the game. I go, oh, I didn't actually, I wasn't paying attention to that or I didn't notice that. Uh, but above and beyond that, um, and, and it's not, it, it transcends past hockey. Uh, I'll bring in people who are used to pre-COVID, bring in people to, to tour this Hockey Night Canada studio. And, you know, I'll be there with four people. I'll introduce the four of them. And right away, he'll, oh, so Jane, da 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 oh, Bob, you know, and he's connecting uh, on such a real level with them and has these great anecdotes to share about their hometowns or, you know, they'll say, oh, I met you in, in 88 when you were in, you know, Charlottetown. They'll be, oh, I remember that. It was for this event. Like, he has an incredible ability to retain information. Um, yeah, it's really cool. In fact, the, the whole group, uh, we have such a great group at Hockey Night right now. I mean, you have these savvy veterans in Elliot and Kelly Rudy who have been around and seen so much and done so much. And then we have this great crew uh, of new, uh, you know, younger up and coming broadcasters mm -hmm. uh, who've been in, involved in the game at such a high level, whether it's Jennifer Botterill or Kevin BX or Anthony Stewart. So we have, we just have this great, uh, good vibe happening right now with, with Hockey Night in Canada. And it's, it's so much fun to be a part of that group. And, uh, you know, we, we go out there every week and we're just hoping to sort of, um, obviously inform the public because we have such a sophisticated audience watching week in, week out, week out mm -hmm. but also entertain them because the bottom line, this is an escape, especially now during these crazy times when people turn on the set, they want to sort of forget about the day-to-day -day problems and escape into something they can really enjoy. So we try to be part of that journey as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, for me, the host of Hockey Night in Canada or Doug, even host just a sports net of uh, during the week game is a dream job for a lot of people is it as glamorous and as fun as we think it is from the outside <laughs> I, I think so i mean you know every time you know th listen it's it's a, it's a job in the sense that it doesn't always go perfectly there are things that can be difficult and challenging but what helps me get through them is when i'm having a challenging day or you know something goes wrong during a show uh, you know, you kind of take a step back and go, I'm watching hockey. We're talking about hockey. This is my job. It's a pretty cool way to get some perspective, right? Um, I, I love it. it. It is glamorous in that sense. What I love about it is it's, it's important to so many people. You know, they care. There's a passionate group of people at home watching, whether they're Oilers fans or Flames fans or Jets fans or Leaf fans, whatever. They're watching. They care about what we're doing. It's this iconic brand that's been around uh, for you know 70 years 
people identify it um, as you know something in their childhood and they have these sentimental feelings about the program that we're on. So it really, uh, you know, it's it's an incredible responsibility because we take it seriously, but it's such a privilege to be part of the program. Uh, it, it is, it is glamorous might not be the word, but it's definitely a, a fun environment. I, I love my job. I love going in. Uh, when the playoffs roll around about a month from now, it's going to be spectacular night in, night out, where the games mattered on such a high level. We're going to have these great Canadian versus Canadian matchups because of the uh, division situation this year with the COVID. Uh, so it's fantastic. It's very, very exciting on a night in, night out basis. And I've said this for a long time, John, the best reality TV is sports television, right? It's unscripted. You don't know what's going to happen. I agree. Absolutely agree. It makes it so exciting. I mean, it, it's it's perfect. It, it's not... You just don't know what's going to happen on any given night. Something crazy might happen, something wonderful, a milestone might be met, a record might be broken. Uh, it makes it very exciting for us. That's awesome. I'm still going with my word glamorous. It looks like an incredible job, and you know, I'm very jealous of you and Jeff Merrick and Ron McLean for the jobs that you guys have. It's You guys do an incredible job, so it's awesome. Um, one I'm not getting I don't think enough love right now is the fact, and you mentioned Jennifer Bodrell, but all these amazing women that are coming up in the industry now and, and the jobs that they do, what's it like having you know a female on the broadcast and how much their knowledge helps you in your, in your job as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I never really even looked at it in, in those terms of having a female on the broadcast. I mean, Cassie Campbell Pascal has paved the way, and you hear this from young women coming up in the industry all the time. I mean, she has been a trailblazer. She has done so much great things in the broadcast industry off the ice as well, and clearly everything she did as a player is so well documented. Um, and, you know, in many respects, a lot of young women, she was that identifiable face where they would say, oh my God, Cassie's there. I feel there's representation. I feel I can come up and do it. Uh, and it's it's been sensational. And quite honestly, Jennifer, Cassie, they, they, I mean, my God, they are students of the game. They know the game inside out, upside down. And it's amazing. I learn from them pretty much every broadcast we do. So uh, it's fantastic. And they're wonderful people as well, you know, most importantly. And that's what's so nice about our group. I think everyone really respects one another and gets along quite well. But yeah, I, I think, you know, it's fantastic that we're finally getting the proper representation and we need more women. We need more BIPOC people. We need more people to really look like the audience that's watching our show. So I think it's great that the doors are finally uh, getting open and that people are really getting the opportunity to, to showcase their talents and skills. And, and a huge part of that, again, is Cassie, uh, you know, for all these years, she's been such a pillar for Hockey Night in Canada. And I think uh, her success has helped uh, blaze a trail for a lot of young women who are now finally getting their opportunity after a, a long wait. That's well said. Um, being in Alberta as I am here, uh, and a chance that I get to see Cassie Campbell quite a lot on uh, the Sportsnet West broadcast with uh, Rick Ball. And the job that she does is just amazing. And I don't think she gets enough on social media and stuff like that for the job that she does. Because the way she thinks the game from a female perspective, it's different. And it's in the game that the ladies play is a little bit different than the men play. It's still it's still amazing to watch them grow. Uh, Tara Sloan's another one that I really enjoy with her hometown hockey stuff. I really miss that on a Sunday night where she was out in different uh, communities and her love and joy of the hockey game. So thank you for those thoughts on uh, the female broadcasters. And I wish, like you, there's more of them. Let's go back to your journey a little bit, though, before you, you hit time with Hockey Night in Canada and Sportsnet. You had a lot of awesome jobs, but I want to take you way back in the day here where you were with uh, TSN and your time in Calgary. Just a little bit about your time in Calgary that blossomed your career a little bit. Well, it was a really exciting time for me. So my first TV job was in Sault Ste. Marie, and I was uh, lucky to, to get on there. It was the first time I, I got you know, an on-camera position. I did news and I did some weather and I covered a lot of sports, which I was very lucky to do. And thankfully it was Joe Thornton's draft year with the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds. So it was actually very exciting to be nice. you know, covering uh, the Greyhounds a little bit back then. They had a very good team. They were eliminated by Manny Malhotra's Guelph Storm in the playoffs that year. But uh, so I've known Joe for, for a number of years now. And after about nine months in Sault Ste. Marie, I was lucky to get a call from Keith Pelly, who was uh, one of the most senior people at TSN and offered me a job uh, to be the Calgary reporter to replace Lisa Bowes, who had been the Calgary reporter. She was moving to Toronto to become an anchor. 
and or to become a sorry a host and an anchor uh, and a reporter and i couldn't believe it i actually when keith had me on the phone i, I thought he was joking because my dream had been to get to a network uh you know like tsn or a sports that was just starting up at the time and this was in 1997 so this was a long time ago and i got it to calgary in september of 97 it was very exciting and it's funny you mentioned cassie campbell pascal because at the time she was cassie campbell and one of the first assignments i had was going out, um, I was covering obviously the Flames, Jerome McGinley I believe was in his rookie year or in his second year with the Flames, Brian Sutter was the head coach, but I also was covering uh, the upcoming mm -hmm. Olympics, the, the, the Nagano Games. So this was um, in preparation for the Nagano Games, uh, the Canadian women's Olympic hockey team was uh, training in Calgary, and that's where they were deciding who was going to make the team. So I was going out to their training sessions, and and Cassie Campbell was one of the first interviews I remember doing. We laugh about that because you know she was kind of at the beginning, or you know just starting out. At, how many Olympics did she have? Four, I believe. Um, you know she was starting out her her amazing Olympic career, and I was starting out as my broadcast career. And uh, we had a chance to sit down and do some interviews with her and Vicky Sanahara and Geraldine. Uh, Heaney and uh, it was it was really a fun time but I was only in Calgary for about nine months or ten months and then the next July I moved I was moved to Toronto relocated to my hometown of Toronto so it worked out well for me um, so it was it was a really good time in, in Calgary cutting my teeth and learning uh, on a network level how to how to become uh, a, a solid broadcaster and it was great I worked with some amazing people out there and we had a you know, producers and camera people and everyone. So it was, you had this great resource behind you. Whereas in Sault Ste. Marie, you're kind of on your own to, to go out and shoot and edit and write and do everything. So it was nice to be a part of a team, which was a great collaboration for me. Now, I know this is a hockey show, but I have to ask if you were around for the 98 Grey Cup, because in Calgary, that was a big Grey Cup for us. We were champions in 98, and that was a really good team around Calgary. Were you around for that Grey Cup or had you moved on by then? So I, one of the first assignments I had uh, with TSN in 1997 was to cover the Grey Cup, and it was actually in Edmonton, and it was the Toronto Argonauts versus Saskatchewan, and the Argonauts were this stacked team with Doug Flutie and, and Paul Mazzotti, and they were, yeah. they were sensational, and I don't even exactly remember what, what the final score was, but it was a blowout win uh, at Commonwealth Stadium. And Calgary had a very good team, but they got knocked out in the playoffs that year because Jeff Garcia – who was their great starting quarterback? Oh, God, he had a, it was a, a leg injury. I don't remember specifically if it was knee or if it was an ACL, but he was on crutches. I remember that much. But they had a very good team in Calgary that year. They had a staunch defense, and they had Garcia and, and Danielson, and a pretty good team. Uh, and I think, if I remember correctly, they actually won the regular season West Division, but they were upset in the playoffs, especially uh, once uh, Jeff Garcia was injured. So uh, it was exciting. That was the one. Great cup I was able to cover uh, was back in '97 in Edmonton. Oh, that's that's cool. That's a good story. Uh, we uh, we were very busy with Doug Flutie and Jeff Garcia out this direction, so had to get mm -hmm. that in there. Even though this is a hockey show, we'll get back to <laughs> we'll get back to the hockey stuff now. Um, so you got that call back to Toronto to work there now with. Now, what was that like getting the call back to your town to be able to work in Toronto in the sports media that you uh, grew up wanting to do? Well, again, it, you know, it's it's surreal. I've you know, I've been I've been afforded such great opportunities, and I, I try never to lose sight of that because it's such a competitive industry. And when you get the opportunity, you have to thank, be thankful that these chances come your way. I was in Calgary, and I actually was enjoying it because. A little bit on an island, you, you, you'd cover the Stampeders and you'd cover the Flames, and the Flames were struggling at the time, and the Stampeders were quite good. Uh, and then you'd mix in, there was some Olympic coverage, and you know, I was actually excited to go to my first Stampede. I never, I've still never been to a Stampede. Uh, and then I got the call, and it all was like, wow, okay, I can go back to Toronto. Um, there was an opening, and they wanted me to be there and to get a chance to do some desk work, not just report in the field. And it was kind of a no brainer. Um, you know, my family's here and my girlfriend, we were doing long distance at the time, is now my wife. So she was here. Uh, so it all connected really well for us um, on a personal level and on a professional level. The nice part, John, of coming back to Toronto is you're, you're a little bit at the epicenter of, of what, you know, the broadcast industry in Canada where it's focused. So I went from covering a couple of sports to, you know, you mix in now the Blue Jays and you have the Argos and you the, the Raptors were just about to, you know, get up where they were up and running, but 
about to get more serious. In fact, when I got here, it was the start of insanity, right? They drafted Vince Carter and it became this whole thing. So uh, to be here for the infancy of the Raptors and, you know, one of the, my favorite assignments I had in my young career was in 1999, I got to cover the Maple Leafs during the playoffs. And um, I was the TSN reporter traveling with the Leafs. So they were play, played Philadelphia in the first round, then they played Pittsburgh in the second round, then they lost to Buffalo and Dominic Hasek in the third round. It was all very exciting. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of going back and forth and going, wow, this is crazy to me. You know, I'm covering the Maple Leafs, the team I grew up watching as a kid. And it was all very surreal and all very interesting and uh, exciting. So I, I've been you know, incredibly lucky along the way. You've had a lot of things things in or under career to cover is that 99 series of buffalo versus toronto near the top of that list i don't know if it was near the top of the list because i've been i've been afforded to to do some pretty amazing things since then but at the time it was just very exciting i was like wow the leafs might actually get to the stanley cup final it was very un unexpected right pat quinn was the head coach and they'd come off some really horrible years and somehow pat quinn came in and right away boom they found a level of success uh, and it was this great mix of veterans on the team, but mixed in with some young players that were up and coming. So it was really, it was very exciting. Um, you know, it's funny, everyone thought they were going to beat Buffalo. And then they ran into Dominic Hasek, right? And Mike Pekka and this this Sabres team of, of upstarts who almost won the Stanley Cup. You know, don't get them started on the skate and the crease thing. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was really exciting. Uh, you know what? It was a different time. I think about now going down to the rink, you know, pre-COVID when we go down to the rink, the volume, the mass of media that are there. In 99, it wasn't that crazy. There was many more print journalists than there were broadcast journalists. You know, there would be there would be someone from the score, someone from, T you know, a handful of us from TSN and, and CBC Sports, et cetera. Now you go there and it's it's wall to wall people. So the, the industry's grown uh, appreciably since back in 99. Um, but I remember fondly, you know, you, you almost were able to have much more intimate conversations with the players back then because there was fewer uh, journalists. I'm glad you mentioned Pat Quinn. It's like you're reading my notes before we had this interview here. Um, <laughs> what was it okay. like dealing with the late, great Pat Quinn? He came in there, like you mentioned, and seemingly overnight turned that 99 Leafs team into a tremendous hockey team. What was it like dealing with Quinn? Man, it was intimidating. I was a young reporter, and Pat Quinn is this big, you know, very affable and likable guy. But, man, when he spoke, you kind of went, okay. And I remember, it's funny you, you bring up Pat Quinn, um, one of the most – fearful moments I had as a broadcaster was we were covering the 99 playoffs and it was between games, I think two and three, it was either two and three or four and five hours, whatever. It was between where the where series was going to shift from Toronto to Philly or Philly to Toronto. The Leafs were flying out to Philly that afternoon and I was sent out and they said, go get some Leaf sound as they prepare for game three. So I went out to their skate and it was all you know, the black aces, it was all the guys who weren't playing, right? It was Glenn Healy and, and, and like the backup goalie. And it was four or five guys who didn't dress in the first two games. And so we call back to the newsroom and say, hey, well, we got some leaf sound, but it's none of the key players. It's not Matt Sundin and all these guys. And uh, our executive producer at the time said, well, you need to get some fresh sound. Whatever you do, come back here with some fresh sound. And I was like, oh, God. You know, I'm a young reporter, right? I'm only a couple of years into the business. And I thought, you know, what's going to happen if Elliot Friedman goes back to the score and he's got these sit-down interviews with Cujo and all this, and I'm coming back with, you know, a guy who hasn't played in two months. That's not going to go look so good for me. So we actually went to the terminal where the Leafs fly out of. We went to this, This uh, it's not at Pearson Airport, it's this little sort of where private planes and charter planes go. And we we waited there, the camera person, I think it was Dean, it must have been Dean Willers, who's a great cameraman. And the two of us were waiting there. And so the Leafs start arriving on a team bus and Pat Quinn comes off the bus and he sees that we're standing, I've got you know the cameraman and I'm standing there, he goes, what are you doing here? And I said, well, you know, I was told that we kind of need to interview the players who are going to play, not the scratches, you know. And he goes, what? Who sent you here? And I said, well, you know, Mike Day, he's our executive producer, and he, I won't give all the colorful <laughs> language that uh, Pat Quinn used, but essentially <laughs> we were up there and he was not happy. And I, I learned a valuable lesson that day. I was like, yeah, I better use my own judgment when we're out in the field about, where, you know, what the line is between being an aggressive young reporter and being someone who's going to jeopardize 
future interviews, you know, because they're overstepping their bounds. And I'm sure Paquin was saying, what a little, who is this little goofballs coming here to, to get our sound? Bottom line is he let me have a couple of interviews. He was nice enough to do that. And we always had a good relationship, but man, it was intimidating. Uh, you know, I, I, you see him and the way he carried himself, uh, very much like Brian Burke. You can tell that Brian Burke would be sort of one of his, his uh, disciples because mm -hmm. Berkey's one of the, the most generous, kind guys you'll ever meet. But at the same time, when he wants to sort of be that alpha male and puff up the chest, you know, he commands a room and can be very intimidating uh, if you didn't know him uh, at that time. So it was it was a really great experience. And we all you know look back fondly on, on the late uh, Pat Quinn. That's awesome. That's a great story there. That's awesome. Uh, um... I always liked hearing Burke talk about Pat Quinn, calling him a gentle giant. Uh, great mind. He was gone too soon. I love the job that Pat Quinn did. Even though he coached the two teams that I really don't like myself, <laughs> he, uh, he was a really good hockey mind, really good, really good job. So um, we're going to take a quick break here. We're going to come back and talk a little bit about the hockey diverse lines and what, what David Amber has seen around the National Hockey this season. So we'll be back here on the Hockey Show. I am your host, John East. What is 10 seconds here, David, and then we'll get going again here. Sounds good. Welcome back to the Double Digit Hockey Show. I am your host, John Easthope. David Amber has joined me here today. If you've missed anything in that first segment, uh, we went through David's career there and a little bit about himself. So go ahead and hit that up on the YouTube page a little bit later. Uh, but right now we want to talk about something. And it's a it's a kind of a difficult uh, topic for a, a white male in today's society because I don't want to overstep my bounds. So if I say anything that's incorrect or wrong, I hopefully I'm corrected in a nice, friendly manner. Uh, I'm always here to learn and grow my we want to talk about this, this issue that's been around all of the sports, but has been really brought to the forefront of hockey by the Hockey Diversity Alliance. Um, watching these guys form this alliance and, and standing up and, and taking this racism issue head on, for me, has been incredible to watch. Um, my stance in this has been to shut up and listen. Um, but that's not good enough just to listen, is, is now to act um, so it's a challenging and difficult topic, David, but maybe you speak a little bit about the job that the Hockey Diversity Alliance has done in your eyes and uh, what it means to you that this has gone forward. Well, John, first of all, I, I think, you know, commendable, first of all, that you'd want to talk about these issues, and they are difficult issues. Um, and I think it's great that you also want to listen because I think that is a key part. I think everyone understanding it takes a little bit of a collaboration of, you know, understanding everyone's situation. And then once everyone there's a more of a realization of some of the systemic problems, then we can address them and fix them moving forward. You know, I, I think the whole landscape <clears throat> of society changed last May 24th, you know, with the killing of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. It really opened a lot of people's eyes about, um, you know, some of the social injustices, the racial injustices, uh, the systemic issues that have continued to plague society, certainly in North America. So, uh, that being said, I, I think what happened is many leagues, we saw the NBA and their players immediately took action. And to their credit, the NHL, uh, even though the, the demographics in the National Hockey League are very different than the NBA or the NFL or, or even Major League Baseball, uh, the players wanted to listen and understand and collaborate and try and use their platform in a positive way. And the league, to their credit as well, and it's a slow process. It's not something that overnight's going to change. But the league um, has created something called the Fan Inclusion Committee, uh, which I'm a member of. Harna Ryan Singh's a member of. Uh, Ron McLean's a member of. Um, they basically called on a number of media members, as well as people within the hockey community and industry, uh, to come up with ways to make the game more inclusive, uh, more equitable, a safe environment for everyone, a, a better experience for everyone. There's the Fan Inclusion Committee, the Youth Inclusion Committee have come together and essentially we're talking to the Executive Committee and those would be the owners and some of the key GMs in the league about here are ways that the league can really improve uh, culturally moving forward. So it's been a work in progress. We've had a number of meetings and I, I'm really excited that I think there will be legitimate change coming and people are really on board and 
I'd like to think that Mr. Floyd didn't die in vain, that his death really stirred a nation uh, to understand that there's been a lot of problems that need to be fixed and won't be fixed overnight, but need to be at least understood and addressed. And, you know, the Hockey Diversity Alliance is part of that, part of raising awareness, part of saying, let's have these tough conversations. Uh, again, I think in a perfect situation, John, just like in society, uh, people want to be included. People want fairness. People want equity. They want to feel like they're part of the game, not that they don't belong in the game. And I, I think that's the ultimate goal, whether it's from a fan perspective, a player perspective, uh, really anyone should feel like hockey's a fantastic community and a fantastic game. And you want to make sure that the, the breadth of it is as wide as it could be. And you don't have a kid who's growing up right now somewhere in Canada or somewhere in the States or wherever and saying, well, I guess it's not for me because I look this way um, or I'm of this sexual orientation or I'm, you know, of, of this religious uh, background. You want to say to everyone, the game's for you. It's a great community. It's open. It's welcoming. It's a safe environment. And, and you could be a big part of it. And so it reflects what society looks like. And, you know, when I walk down the streets in Toronto, when you're walking through uh, streets in Calgary, um, you know, it's a whole mixed bag of people and the, and the game should reflect that on all levels from the top executives and the ownership group all the way down. So I think that's ultimately the goal of what uh, the Hockey Diversity Alliance, as well as what the NHL is striving for right now. And I think that's a great thing. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, well said there, David. Um, listening to Matt Dumba in the bubble last year when the playoffs got back underway, uh, something that really struck me what he was talking about in that amazing speech he did before that that uh, playoff game. The conversation comes, but then the conversation seems to go away. We find a way to continue that conversation uh, beyond just maybe a week's point, and you know that it fades to the background again. One thing the Hockey Diversity Alliance has really tried to do is keep message on the forefront. I know we've seen it among other sports. We see now in, in Premier League soccer, they still take the knee before every kickoff. How is there something that, that the hockey community can do to keep this conversation in the forefront in each each individual team and effort as we try to continue this equality? That is a fantastic question. And first off, Matt Dumba, in, incredible. And for those who aren't you know familiar with the mm -hmm. speech he made before the playoffs began in the bubble last year, it was sensational. He was incredibly brave, incredibly mm -hmm. articulate. He spoke so candidly and genuinely from the heart and he spoke about topics that are very important. To your question about how do we keep that in the forefront, you know, congratulations to you. I mean, you know, here we are having this interview, we could talk about all sorts of things and you're bringing this to the forefront. You're making this part of the agenda. I think we got to continue having these conversations. And something you said a few minutes ago struck me as well when you said, I want to shut up and listen, but I know that's not enough. I think right now, more more so than ever, you know, allyship, right? That's important. Um, it's not just a matter of keeping the conversation going. It's a matter of acting. Um, you know, if you're at a minor hockey game and, and people are saying inappropriate things or s saying things, you know, uh, that, that sh you know, that are wrong, um, you have to speak up against it. Uh, because if you don't and you just let it go by the wayside, then you're complicit, then you're allow you're allowing it. And you're maybe in some respects encouraging it to continue because you don't speak up. People have to take a stand now. It's no longer good enough to sort of say, well, I, I'm, I treat everyone equally, so I've done my part. No, it's more than that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people are saying it's not enough to, to, to not be racist. You have to be anti-racist. So when you hear things, when you mm -hmm. see things, if, if people are excluding people, if people are saying derogatory comments, stereotypical comments, if people are alienating certain individuals or groups, it, it's not um, it's not part of what the hockey community wants, and it's not really what society wants or needs either. So that's it's incumbent on all of us to to speak up, uh, be allies uh, with one another. And I, I've said this before: it's not a a black or white issue; it's a wrong or right issue. So be on the, the right side of the ledger, and collectively, there's enough of us. Uh, who can align our forces and speak our voices and make sure that we stomp out um, people who, who are just behaving in an inappropriate manner, whether it's at the hockey rink or just in society in general. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, the one thing I really enjoy about the Hockey Diversity Alliance, too, is that we're not just getting these guys who couldn't quite make the NHL or stick in the NHL. 
superstars like Andrew Kane that are, are at the forefront of this well, Matt Dumb at the forefront of this, trying to lead that charge and trying to make everyone you know, see that there is a problem here in things. One thing that I always like to, to go back to is I have a couple of, of good examples of, of – I'm a fan of the Lepture games from Lepridge. Uh, we have a, a kid named Zach Stringer. He's from Haiti that was adopted into a white family in the game of hockey, and he's now – an NHL prospect coming up for this draft. He's draft eligible. And the one thing that I really enjoy about him is, is he's another player rather than skin. Uh, the Calgary players, if not the best player in the organization, uh, Jerome McGinley, a, a, a man of, of color as well, and, and celebrating his career. And I think we need more of those situations around the game of hockey. So I'm, I'm really Really happy to see that it's it's the stars standing up as well as, as the guys that didn't quite make it or you have guys in your media that are standing up and taking a stand for these things. So I commend the hockey audience uh, here in the way that they've I've had it. And I really enjoy these broadcasts like yourself coming on my show and, and, and sharing your thoughts on it. So I appreciate that. It is an easy topic to talk about. You are uh, in the position that I am in. I'm I, The people you've throw that term white privilege at the time. I understand where I come and that others have more difficult uh, opportunity to get to where they want to go than I do. So appreciate your thoughts on that, David. Is there any other message that you wish to bring forth about this type of issue uh, to, uh, to help others see more and help them progress in their understanding? Um, well, hold on. First, I had a question. First of all, well said, John. And, and who is the player on Lethbridge? Yeah. I'll be keeping an eye Thank out you. for him. Uh, Zach Stringer, he uh, he was rated by the the NHL uh, NHL scouts, the pro scouts. He's uh, in that fourth round, fifth round area for, to be a, a draft select if he makes it. So he's a uh, he's a dynamic winger. He's got he's got speed for days, and he's, his hands are slowly catching up. So <laughs> okay, so something to keep an eye on. Um, I, no, I mean I really think we've touched on yeah. on the key points. I really think. Um, you know, we're at a time in society, and I know everything's become very polarized in many respects, but I do think identifying, you know, other people's situation, uh, understanding, you know, it's that whole adage of treat, you know, others the way you want to be treated and trying to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. And I think once we have that uh, empathy, once we have that, you know, compassion for one another, I think we'll, we'll move in the right direction. Having these types of conversations, it really does bridge the gap. It brings communities and people together, understanding one another. Um, I don't think people are that different. I really don't. I think people want um, to live good lives. They want to be treated well. They want to hopefully treat other people well. And um, I think when you break it all down, uh, people are quite similar regardless of uh, you know, their upbringing and, and how they grew up. I, I think we all want the same things for ourselves, for our kids, et cetera. And um, when you kind of take it to that human level, I think um, it could bridge a lot of the gaps that people see. Just, you know, the whole book cover, you know, might look different. Your journey and your upbringing is a little different than mine, but I'm sure the things you want in your life are very similar to the things, John, that I want in my life. So um, I think once we have that level of empathy and understanding, we'll, we'll move together as one it'll be uh it'll be a great thing so little by little and obviously i'd, you know, I'd love to snap my fingers and have everything perfect it doesn't work like that but i do think these sorts of conversations and and people gaining uh information and understanding and, and realizing the plight of others and, and some of the obstacles some people have faced did, uh, have uh, face on a daily basis um, just because of how they look or their sexual orientation or their religion uh, can really be be fixed by by having that sort of compassion for one another and understanding. For those thoughts, it is it is a a difficult topic on some levels, but I'm glad we got it out there and talked about it. Please, if anyone out who's listening or watching this, you know, has struggles or or needs someone to talk to, reach out. And there's always someone there to talk to and to talk about these things with. Um, let's uh, let's get back to a little bit of something more lighthearted. Um, Let's talk about what we've seen around the National Hockey League in this season. You know, this North Division thing, uh, people either seem to really love it or really hate it. Um, not mm -hmm. sure where you fall in on it, but what have you seen throughout the North Division on a whole so far through the season here? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I do agree with you. You know, some people love it, some people hate it. Some people are a little like, enough already. I've seen, you know, blank team versus blank team now the seventh, eighth time. One thing I'll say about the North Division is we've been incredibly lucky and you know, and all the divisions have stars, but I mean, my goodness, when you have a division with McDavid and Matthews and Dreisaitl 
and Marner and, you know, I can go on and on and on, the Shifleys, et cetera. I mean, we've been blessed to have so many good young players in this division specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on any given night, you're getting a chance to see some very electric players. You know, uh, you know the two Kachucks, so this Brady Kachuk is just such a special player. He's really right there mm -hmm. with his brother Matthew. It's, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's lucky. You know, we're in this great division with these great young players. And the fact that um, what I like about the North Division is you have these seven very passionate, sophisticated fan bases, right? They die for their team. They're hanging on every goal. And then you're having these two matchups on a night-to-night -night basis, which makes it really exciting. You know, we just didn't get enough of a good thing before. You know, the fact that Connor McDavid hadn't played a Hockey Night in Canada game in Toronto on a Saturday night till this year, that's unfathomable, right? He's been in the league, what, five, six years now? The thought that he hadn't played in his home, you know, he grew up outside Toronto. He hadn't played sort of at the Air Canada Centre, now Scotiabank Arena, on a Saturday night against the Leafs. Seems wrong, you know, because Edmonton and Toronto mm -hmm. were only playing twice a year. So um, it's been nice in that sense. And I think, you know, Gary Bettman has said they're going to go back to the conventional divisional lineups, which I understand. You know, I, I get that. Um, I think it makes sense in a lot of respects as well, travel-wise, et cetera. You know, Vancouver doesn't play any games in their own time zone right now. Every single game is in a different time zone except their home games. So uh, that isn't really fair for them. I get going back to that. But what I'm mm -hmm. hopeful for is instead of having mm -hmm. two Canadian matchups west east, maybe they'll increase it to four. The idea of, you know, mm -hmm. the Leafs, the Canadians, the Senators getting to play the teams in the west four times each – uh, two and two, and you diminish a few of those um, other uh, divisional rivalries. You know, if Toronto were to only play Buffalo, you know, four times instead of five, and one of those games gets thrown out to become a, a Flames game or an Oilers game, I'm all for it. So I'm hoping they find a way to continue these these regional rivalries, or in this case, a countrywide rivalry, uh, even if they go back to the, the traditional divisional matchups. I agree with you there. I was about to go there myself. Uh, I would. I'm all for dropping a, a nine bucks game in favor of having these come through one more time or, or yeah. not going to San Jose one more time to go see the other Kachuk another time. I'm all for that myself as well. I've enjoyed the action so far uh, throughout this North Division. There's been a lot of new rivalries, I think, born, renewed rivalries. Edmonton Calgary one is certainly uh, kicked up a year. Is there one thing that's in your mind in this division or has it just been night after night of just good action for you? Wow. Um, to, to put this into one thing, um, I, I mean, I think I just what's been struck with is just, you know, how incredibly good the, the superstar young players. And we're fortunate, again, to have them in Canada. When you look at McDavid, Dreisaitl, Matthews specifically, I mean, Matthews really looks like that generational score, right? Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to compare him to Alexander Ovechkin just yet, but he just... You know, he starts out his career with five straight 30-plus goal seasons. He's the only guy right now to have scored 30-plus goals in the, in the last five years. Uh, he has such an incredible knack around the neck. He, net, he can finish, you know, so effortlessly. That release is second to none. Uh, and then, you know, McDavid and Dreisaitl, and my goodness, just to watch what they can do, and, and certainly McDavid, the speed with which he can do it, it's just something – phenomenal it's not like we didn't know these things i'm sure someone's listening to this podcast going duh it was this we didn't know this the last four years but i think when you're seeing it on a night in night out basis it's really just permeating my brain at least just how talented these guys are it also has maybe led me to believe and understand we're really ready for the stanley cup to come back to canada and i don't care where it comes back mm -hmm. to and i've said this for a number of years but i think now with the level of interest our ratings have been really quite exceptional this year um, you know, whether it's getting to Winnipeg, you know, who had a sniff a few years ago when they lost out to Vegas in the Western Conference final, or clearly, you know, Montreal and Toronto, where it's been, it's been years and years and years, you know, um, you know, people are ready uh, across the country. Uh, you know, it's funny. I just remember in my teens, you know, every year it seemed the cup was in Canada when the Oilers had that incredible run and the Flames had a, some ex exceptional teams and won their Stanley Cup. And then they had the Habs in both 86 and 93 sort of bookending all those great Alberta teams. We had just assumed, you know, it might be two years, might be three years, might be five years, but, you know, a Canadian team will win. 
what are we at now? 1993, right? We're coming on what 30 years, right? I mean, yeah. it's it's been a while. Uh, I think people are ready, and it would be really fun. And I do think whoever comes out of that North Division, as much as Leaf fans hate Habs fans, as much as you know the Canucks fans seem to kind of hate everyone, <laughs> I think there might be some rallying <laughs> behind whoever comes out of that division. I, it's, I, know, I know people probably scratch their heads, right? I don't think you know, the battle, I don't think Flames fans are going to just jump all over the Connor McDavid bandwagon. <laughs> but I think in a way, there'll be some that say, yeah, it's kind of, we're ready for it. It's ready to, whoever it is representing Canada, it'd be pretty cool to have uh, a, a cup winning team in Canada again. So maybe that's one of my takeaways. For sure. And that's a good takeaway. Um, we talk about this North Division and we love it and we love the games. We love the rivalries. And then there's all this talk about, well, is this the weaker division in your eyes? If wh whoever makes it out of this division, are they a tender for the Stanley Cup or are they fighting behind the eight ball these other divisions being quote unquote stronger? No, I mean, listen, you get to the final four, you're, you're a contender for the Stanley Cup, right? Uh, would If you're to say right now, who do I think is going to win the Stanley Cup? I'm probably not picking anyone in the North Division ahead of Tampa, uh, ahead of maybe Vegas. A lot of people like Colorado. I'm not quite there with them, but I still think them as a very good, viable team. You know, Washington, uh, another team I definitely think will be a hard outcome playoff time. The Islanders are going to be hard out. So would I say whoever comes out of the North Division will be the favorite? No, but when you get into a seven-game series, um, you know, anything could happen. And by that point, they've already knocked out two very good teams. I mean, you'll have had to – it's going to be a battle. I mean, think about how tough and out the Winnipeg Jets are going to be, right? Think about how tough and out the Leafs are going to be potentially. Mm -hmm. So these are not teams you're just going to be able to walk through. So if you get through that North Division, you'll yes, you'll be a viable team. Uh, I still look at Tampa as the prohibitive favorite. I, I just see that team from last year that was so good. They're about to get Kucherov back for the playoffs. I assumingly they're going to get Stamkos back. I know he's out right now. Um, they went and added a few pieces just like they did last year. They have the best goalie in the league at this point in Vasilevsky. They have the best defenseman in Victor Hedman. And Kucherov's one of the top handful of forwards. I mean, what's not to like, right? Um so I think it's going to be really interesting. I, I think it adds an element. I'll, I'll, I'll mention John too. We don't know. We don't know. I mean, that's what that's what's making this kind of interesting. We we don't know how these teams are going to match up, and that's what's going to be really. Usually by the third round, the excitement kind of wanes a little bit, and it's just those four fan bases that get really pumped up. I think this year might be different. This year you might go, well, we never saw Tampa versus Vegas. How's that going to match up? We never saw. You know, the Leafs versus Washington. How's that going to match up or whomever, right? Or Edmonton versus Washington or or, or Pittsburgh or the Islanders. We don't know. Uh, and that's what makes it so exciting. Um, I think it'll add a real interesting wrinkle to those conference finals and even to the Stanley Cup final because it'll be sight unseen. And I don't know if you're a baseball fan, but uh, when the Jays won their two World Series, when they went onto the field against Atlanta in 92 and against the Philadelphia Phillies in 93, they never played. It was before there was interleague play. So we went out there and we went, oh, my mm -hmm. God, the Jays have to go up against Schmoltz and Glavin and Greg Maddox. What's going to happen? And lo and behold, everyone had picked Atlanta as the favorite. Well, the Jays won in six. So there you go. We just don't know, mm -hmm. which I love. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I am a baseball fan and uh, – it in a little bit to those around the nation. I, I'm, a, I'm a Kansas City Royals fan. Um, I was a big George Brett guy when I was growing up. So uh, okay. uh, I, I, uh, I take it from Jays fans all the time, but I like to give it back this weekend because we took three or four well, from them. So it's all right, though. I don't, I'm not sure how old you are, John, but in 1985, you could have bragged all you wanted because that was Jays versus Kansas City. The Jays were up three games to one, and then – George Brett did his thing, and and what do you know, Brett Saberhagen, if you remember back in the, those days, and they they won the, the World Series again. Mm -hmm. You know, they beat the Jays in the ALCS. So there you go. I'm a, I'm I was a little young at that point, but I really like bringing yeah. up that 2015 series uh, uh, over and <laughs> over. So um, we'll get back to the hockey though. Here, um, there is one team that I wanted to hit on outside the North Division that. I'm not sure how other how many people have them on their radar at this moment, and that's the Florida Panthers. They've hung with mm -hmm. the Tampa Bay Lightning. They've hung with the Carolina Hurricanes, and they look like a legitimate hockey team. 
finally. What do you have the Florida Panthers throughout this season? Well, it's sort of the reset button. It's funny. They asked us to pick our who would be the surprise teams and who would be our disappointment uh, teams coming into this year. And um, for full transparency, I, I picked Boston as the disappointment. So I was clearly wrong there because they've proven me wrong and they've been very good. But I picked Florida as the surprise team. And I have basically felt, you know, you have these great young forwards, Huberto, Barkov, et cetera. And Bobrovsky was horrible last year. And I figured he'd reset to that guy who's won two Vesnas. Uh, he hasn't been quite that good, but Chris Drieger's, you know, been able to pick up the slack and they have this good tandem that seems to be working. And I also figured that they would take on a bit more of the identity of Joel Quenville. It was hard in his first year to maybe get the team to play the way he wanted. And now he's been there longer than that. They, they made some great additions. They had Carter Verhage off the championship team, the Lightning. And Aaron Ekblad's really sorry for his season-ending injury, but he was having a Norris caliber season before that injury. So everything was pointed in the right direction. How seriously do I take them? I'll be honest with you. Um, as much as I expected them to have a bounce back and be a better team, which they've been, I still look at Tampa and I still look at Carolina as the prohibitive two favorites. I expect Carolina and Tampa to be meeting in the division final uh, when the dust settles. I like Florida. Um, but I think they're missing a little bit of the speed and depth of Carolina, and they certainly don't have the superstar power to the level of the Tampa Bay Lightning, um, who I think is probably the team to beat in that division. But Florida, it's been a great scene for them, and uh, I'm really happy to see them sort of back on, on the map right now. Now, the reason I cued in on, on the Panthers a little bit is we talked about the rivalry uh, of Toronto Montreal. Montreal or Toronto, Ottawa, Calgary, Tin. We haven't seen a Tampa Bay, Florida playoff series yet to this point. Uh, and if we do get it, I think it'll be amazing. And that's why I wanted to bring up the Florida Panthers because I think that's going to be really good for hockey in the, the Sun Belt of the, of the United States there to see those two teams battling for uh, playoff supremacy there. Just one last thing before I let you go. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, no, have the dogs. Uh, <laughs> One last thing before I let you go here. Uh, just one last thought on on the North Division. The Vancouver Canucks had themselves a, a COVID outbreak, a tough time there for a while. They come back and they have a really gutsy effort versus the Toronto Maple Leafs and, and squeak out in there. Maybe just a thought on what you saw from Vancouver there. Unfortunate dust COVID. You have to excuse my dog. The postman just came and my dog is freaking nope. out right now. So hold on, someone's coming for a little help for me. I think. <laughs> yeah, Bella, the uh, our dog Bella, the, the bark is much worse than the bite. But um, yeah, you know what? Listen, well, first of all, a Florida Tampa matchup. I think that was part of these divisional rivalries that you know Commissioner Bettman was really excited about the idea that um, you know you can have these new rivalries sort of uh, emerge and and. Tampa and Florida, the reason there hasn't been a great rivalry, they're, they're in the same region, but they've never really both been good at any given time. So finally, they're both good, and that could be mm -hmm. something that grows into the future as one of the great NHL rivalries. Um, as far as Vancouver last night, that was, that was a great storyline. Um, you know, they've been through a lot just from a human level. The expectation was they were going to come out and they were going to have the doors blown off of them because a lot of these guys were quite sick. Uh, you know, they're the seventh or eighth team to go through a real bad COVID outbreak, but much worse than anyone else. It's this new variant. And in texting back and forth mm -hmm. with some of the players, they were in really bad shape. You know, Travis Green made a point of saying that uh, this wasn't a case of, well, nine guys have COVID, but they're all asymptomatic. They're kind of just saying, well, we have COVID, but we don't feel a thing. These guys, you know, Quinn Hughes, from what I understand, was on IV. I mean, it was scary and it ran rampant through the team for them to come out and play with the amount of resilience and passion and care and really whether it was adrenaline or or just pride of being a professional it, it was it was beautiful to see and there had been a lot of people saying well they're coming back too early and da, 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 you know and you know for them to kind of go out there and be able to perform at the level they did john to me says they really want to show we're professionals and we're ready to be back here we want to be back here mm -hmm. and um, we're going to leave it all on the ice. It was it was really great. It wasn't it wasn't a hockey story as much to me as it was a human story. And we're all in this. Listen, this you know, COVID. We're in a global pandemic right now. Like everyone mm -hmm. at this point knows someone 
whether it's one degree, two degrees, three degrees, that's that's had COVID. And they're scary stories. You know, people are getting sick, people are going to the hospital, people are going, you know, it's dark in many parts of the country right now, in many parts of the world. To have this team to be able to rebound a little bit from what was a really scary outbreak for them and have success on the ice the way they did against a very good Toronto team was was really cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm not a Canuck guy in the least, but I, I have to give them uh, the taps from the way that Bo Horvat and uh, Britton Hope led their team last night. It was just it was incredible to watch uh, as a far from a human standpoint. So really good. So awesome, David. I remember your time today. I'll let you go. Uh, getting close to the end of the show here. Appreciate your thoughts. Appreciate your the Hockey University Alliance as well. Um, thanks so much for your time today. I hope you have a good enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. John, thank you so much for having me on and uh, enjoy the rest of the season and, and best of luck with the, your, your burgeoning uh, broadcasting career as well. And uh, hopefully uh, it'll be uh, fun and glamorous is the word you use. Hopefully it'll be just as glamorous for you as it's been for thank others. You. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate that. Appreciate this so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me and on. And thank you listeners for joining me on another of the Double Digit Hockey Podcast. We A little bit of delay there. Sorry, David. Thank you to the listeners and the viewers of the Double Digit Hockey Show. This is Johnny Soap, your host. Remember, you can see us every Thursday on astvproductions.com. That was David Amber joining me today. A little bit of a delay at the end of that, so I apologize for that. But it was really good conversation to have with David uh, as we talked a little bit about the Hockey Diversity Alliance. Please go check them out and check out what you can do in the, in the words. Anything that you missed from David Amber, let me know, and I'll make sure you find the correct link so you can listen to that part again of the show. Lots of news and notes from around the National Hockey League. Uh, we didn't get to touch on a lot of what I had wanted to, but we had a better conversation for it. I uh, really appreciate David Amber. I really appreciate Hockey Night in Canada for making him available for me on the show. Um, don't forget you can follow the show on social media at Double Digit Hockey. The hockey part is spelled H-K-Y, so Double Digit H-K-Y, and that's on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can follow myself at Vintage84 on those same platforms. Thank you so much for joining me today on the show. Next week, we're going to go back to some junior hockey talk as Darren DuPont will join me. Uh, he is part of the Rob Peterson show. Uh, he'll join me and talk all about what he's seen from around the Western Hockey League and junior hockey. Uh, this has been another good edition of the Double Digit Hockey Show. Thanks so much. We'll see you guys next time on, on the show. Thank you.